it's really a pleasure to be here and to see all of you. Um, lots of new friends, I hope, um, and some, some old friends as well. Um, and in fact, uh, I gave a lecture in, in Bochum in 2012, in the spring of 2012, um, at the invitation of uh, Professor Eric Hurl. Um, and that lecture was, in a way, an attempt to kind of work in, in the wake of this book that I wrote about uh, Francois Laruelle to sort of axiomatize digital theory, kind of uh, working through that in a, in, a, in a rudimentary early way. Um, and I didn't really know it then, but it would really spark a whole new research project that I'm actually still working on now. So um, I know that seems very slow, uh, but I've been um, sidetracked by other projects in the meantime. I, hopefully I, that's my excuse. Um, but uh, yeah, so today in a sense I'm kind of returning in, in, a, in, a, in a nice way maybe to some of those same questions uh, here in Bochum, uh, the same questions from, from, from 10 years ago. So I, I want to talk um, today about digital philosophy, um, but maybe do it in a kind of unusual way. And so I want to speak um, to begin, um, I want to use three little kind of eureka moments for me from the past few months. So through a series of, of lucky turns, I found myself in possession of a certain zip file. Not particularly large, at 2.9 megs. And extracting the zip archive, I was delighted to discover 297 files, all with exotic file types. Not doc or JPEG, but .c, .s, .h. These were text files containing source code, written primarily in the C computer language but also in assembly, uh, assembly which is a type of uh, primitive language that's very close to machine code. And nosing around in the code, I found an implementation of the game of life, John Conway's classic cellular automata simulation from 1970. That piqued my interest. I found a radiosity demo a little app that implements the uh, so-called diffuse illumination technique that's um, so necessary for realistic computer graphics. I also found a demo app for ray tracing, another crucial technique used in 3D rendering. And of course, the name of the zip file reveals the secret. I had stumbled onto the hard drive of Friedrich Kittler, the celebrated German media theorist and former professor here in Bochum, who died in 2011. I had in my hands Kittler's computer, or at least I had some of his software. Now, if you've read Kittler's essays, you might know that he has written on precisely these things, particularly radiosity and ray tracing, the last two things I showed. And in fact, at that time, I also knew about Kittler's ray tracer, thanks to Mark Marino and his book called Critical Code Studies, where in fact he devotes an entire chapter to an analysis and an interpretation of Kittler's ray tracer source code, which is a very unusual genre of scholarly work, in fact. But code goes obsolete very fast. And even software from 20, 15, 10 years ago is often difficult to run, much less to recompile from source code. And so after emailing with Paul Feigelfeld, who is one of the stewards of Kittler's archive, Paul pointed out something that I actually had overlooked, the existence of a compiled binary executable for one of these files for the ray tracer. And so this was my second Eureka moment. With any luck, 
This executable, written for long obsolete systems, would just run. And sure enough, it took a little time. After several hours of trial and error, I managed to find the right emulator, the right flavor of Linux in the proper 32-bit architecture to run on the emulator, logged in, typed change mod 755 on x sup trace, and to my great surprise, was greeted not with an error, but with a text prompt. Ray tracer himmel und hölle, or in English, ray tracer heaven and hell. I was in. And here is a simple render with a floating brass pyramid over a rippling plain of water and a steel sky in the rear. And you can see the, the terminal in, in, the, in the background and then the, the kind of display window in the foreground. Okay, so we know this image seems like child's play compared to, I don't know, Avatar, Avatar 2 or Elden Ring. Nevertheless, Kittler coded all of this without any graphics engine, no graphical libraries of any kind. He created the mathematical representation of all of the 3D, uh, three-dimensional objects like pyramids, spheres, and planes, so these can be defined strictly mathematically. He created the procedural textures. Um, that's what gets mapped onto the outside of the, of the model. He created all the procedural textures using noise functions. Um, and of course, he created the entire ray tracing functions themselves. He was working off of hobby, a hobbyist magazine that had code samples for him, which convert a simulated 3D space into a 2D array of colored pixels. And I'll call your attention to a few things that I know if you were here, he would want us to look at. Uh, the pyramid casts a shadow at the center rear of the ground plane, uh, a non-trivial feature. Uh, the pyramid is also reflected in the rippled, uh, rippling water in the center bottom. And also the underside of the pyramid is also reflecting the ground below it. And these are some of the basic graphical features that ray tracing affords. And last but not least, look at the title of the window. Yeah. Esthesis. Proving that Kittler knew exactly where computation ends and perception begins. The third eureka moment happened when I started to look through Kittler's radiosity demo that I showed you a couple slides back. And, and unfortunately, I don't yet have a compiled binary, um, and, and I can't actually show it to you running, but I think it wouldn't necessarily be impossible to, to get it compiled and running in the future. And looking through the source code, I kept on seeing an unusual data type, right? So code uses variables. The variables will have a type. And the type was called real, R-E-A-L, in all caps. And now, I haven't written much C code in my life. And Kittler's files are in a mixture of English and German. So was this real some part of the C nomenclature that I hadn't yet learned? Maybe it was an, 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 an acronym for something, R-E-A-L. Maybe it was a German word I didn't know. Right click, jump to definition, and my jaw really dropped on this one. Define real float. So using it like an alias, Kittler had mapped the word real over to the data type for floating point numbers, which is just a way to have a decimal number in a machine. Now, I always knew Kittler was a genius a troubled genius, perhaps, and certainly a complicated one. Yet this really stunned me. But why not? Kittler had already, had already shown us how Jacques Lacan's trio of real, 
imaginary and symbolic, might be embodied in media devices, famously in the gramophone, in film, and in the typewriter. So why not rename the data types how they ought to be called? Real numbers can't exist inside digital computers, of course. That's a limitation of the design. But floats, floating point numbers, are the best approximations. So why not follow Kittler's lead and simply call floats reals? And maybe we could do a similar thing for integers and just call them naturals. The real and the natural, a solid basis for digital theory. And I should add as a little footnote, uh, someone uh, clued me into an interesting detail here, which I did not know, which is that the language Fortran actually does use real as a proper data type, and it refers to a decimal number or floating point number. So uh, the, the, the obvious answer is that Kittler was just using this older nomenclature from, from um, Fortran and then just adding this kind of alias or this, this, this new data type um, in his own code. Okay. So let me also just stress at the outset, uh, I, I fully realize the folly of coming to Germany and giving a lecture about Kittler. Uh, I realize that some of you know a lot more about him than I do. Some of you probably even knew Kittler personally. Um, so if I have some insight, perhaps, into this work as a programmer, maybe you can also tell me about things I've missed or, or have gotten wrong. Okay, so Kittler's computer. This seemed like a good place to, 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 to begin to answer this question of digital philosophy. What is the digital? Is there such a thing as digital philosophy? And if so, what is it? So those are some of the questions that I want to think about today. But then again, Kittler's first love wasn't so much the digital analyzer as it was the analog synthesizer. So let's rewind the story a few years earlier. Soldered and assembled carefully by hand during the late 1970s and 80s, Kittler's synthesizer was really something to behold. And here's one description that I found. Uh, quote, is a series of modular cubes. Uh, five cubes made of brushed aluminum in a smart, minimalist design reminiscent of Dieter Rams, which were burnished into gold from cigarette smoke. Starting in May 1977, and based on a modular synthesizer design he found in a magazine, Kittler built his instrument out of circuit boards, wires, resistors, potentiometers, and all the other materials of the do-it-yourself synth hobbyist. These components and tools later immortalized in a 2013 large format photograph by Jan Peter Zontag, which adorns the wall of the Mex seminar room in Lüneburg, Germany. Some reports have it that Kittler would even sketch his circuit diagrams on the verso side of the page proofs for Discourse Networks, his uh, 1985 magnum opus, although that story almost sounds too good to be true. Kittler's synthesizer was not a computer, at least not a digital one, and he preferred it that way. And when he did write digital code, I believe one of the modules actually had the capacity to uh, accept digital code. Kittler, in, those case, in that case, insisted on making his own writer for the reprogrammable memory chips, which are called EEPROMs. So this is a reprogrammable me memory chip where you can put code on it. But he insisted on making his own writer thereby avoiding his Windows PC as much as possible. 
And you can see that the exterior housings of Kittler's EEPROMs already had their own little windows. So why rely on Microsoft Windows? And you can see the circular shape is actually a window into the chip. The chip windows were a primitive but effective form of reset. And what you could do is you would flash the window under ultraviolet light, which is what you see here, and that would wipe the memory and start again. Use light to write code. Or, to be more precise, use non-visible light to delete code. And I found this amazing quote from Kittler, which I'll read, that says more about this. So this is Kittler. Today's most beautiful windows, and there's a lot of punning here around Windows and Microsoft Windows. Today's most beautiful windows are those adorning EEPROMs, erasable, programmable, read-only memory. It's the chip. These windows are not virtual so much as instructional because behind them in a rare glimpse one may peer into the silver filigree of the silicon transistors. And yet this frontal view remains as always a side effect. EEPROM windows exist merely to be irradiated with ultraviolet light, leaving only zeros in its shadow. Vacant windows, no more and no less, are the promise of today's technology. Okay, classic Kitlerian uh, paragraph. Vacant windows. It seems that electricity and ultraviolet light were philosophical materials for Kittler. And so this is why I'm interested in this question of digital philosophy. How, how do the machines connect to this? How do digital machines relate to theory and philosophy? Is there some kind of a relationship to between those things? I've even started to list some of the important devices. Uh, I just showed Kittler's synthesizer. We, of course, could talk about Nietzsche's typewriter. Uh, and the game could continue indefinitely. Maybe back to Freud's mystic writing pad, or maybe the camera obscura for philosophers like Sarah Kaufman, or maybe the neural net for someone like Catherine Malibu, or the information graphic for W.E.B. Du Bois. A parade of philosophies media a priori. I just said typewriter. Can it also condition digital philosophy? Quote, the typewriter is a characterless cloud, wrote Martin Heidegger in one of his more oracular moments. Perhaps he was thinking of Friedrich Nietzsche, who had used his typewriter to compose philosophy, to be sure, while also composing clouds of characters without character. And some of you might know these, uh, these texts from Nietzsche. As the old saying goes, the invention of a new technology is simultaneously the invention of a new form of accident. And so I think of this as a sort of keyboard smash uh, invented here by Friedrich Nietzsche um, also revealing, I think, the in inherently combinatorial nature of the typewriter and perhaps of writing more generally. As characters recombine into novel arrangements ungoverned by the laws of semantics or syntax. And yet even here, an ironclad rule still reigns, which is the digital. We have each letter isolated in this scriptio continua. It exists alone, each letter, apart from the flow of the old cursive hand. Or, as Willem Flusser so economically put it, this is why typewriters go click. Why? Because they are digital. 
Okay, but what is the digital exactly? Is it possible to think digitally? How can you spot a digital philosopher if you see one? And to answer this, I want to talk for a moment about method. Okay, so where, where could we begin in this path here? I think some approaches to digital technology are, as it were, descriptive. And these kinds of projects will often begin from, I don't know, digital culture, or from a user's phenomenological experience, perhaps, with, with machines. In order to push a synthetic claim, benefiting from that vantage. These approaches might build intellectual momentum from archival or empirical research, trying to uncover technical artifacts lost to history, or to rearticulate the meaning of technical devices that saturate such a history. Other approaches to digital technology focus more on definitions and axioms. And these kinds of projects try to plumb the foundations of things. Instead of hunting the pertinent detail, they prize the general convention, sometimes even the universal law. Taking a cue from the rationalists more than the empiricists, these kinds of projects build their cases by defining the conditions of possibility for anything whatsoever. So instead of specific details anticipating general claims, here the general stipulates a framework within which all sorts of specifics might emerge. It's not hard to find digital theory books today that focus on the messy ambiguity of technology and material things. It's also not hard to find books that tend to banish such messy contingency through the irrepressible necessity of digital logic. And I'm thinking a lot about this dynamic between contingency and necessity that discontented pair locked in a discontented union. And I should say that recently I read a manuscript by Aidan Evans called Digi The Digital and Its Discontents, and so you might hear some of that um, influence coming, coming through here. Even today, with fiber optic cables garlanding the planet, and digital services managing the population, there are surprisingly few attempts, I think, to theorize the digital explicitly. What is a byte? Do we even yet know? What is the philosophical significance of a logical operator? Where do computers fit within the history of thinking? And to be clear, uh, I just wrote a book, as, as Anna mentioned, uh, called Uncomputable, um, which is explicitly about this kind of former ca first category, about the kind of messy, contingent ambiguity of material and, and, artif and artifactal objects. So I don't want to abandon or deny that tradition. Um, yet now, kind of in this talk and, and in the immediate future, I'm really starting to focus more on some of those other questions that I just enumerated. Maybe in an earlier time, we might have called this a structuralist theory of the digital, um, or at least an approach that defines the digital in terms of its core structures or its foundational formal arrangements. And I, I would not, uh, uh, I would, that, that, that label I think is appropriate. But if that particular label isn't apt, maybe rationalist is, or at the very least philosophical. For I'm interested in a rationalist theory of the digital more than an empirical description of it. And I do think that presents uh, complications in thinking about AI, uh, because we've certainly moved into the, out of the rationalist phase uh, into the empiricist phase. Okay, so what is the digital exactly? Well, we could talk about Android phones, we could talk about Twitter, we could talk about PlayStation, or we could go a bit further 
we could define the digital as a mode of representation using discrete units, as contrasted with the analog, which uses continuous variation. Those would be the definitions you'd find in the dictionary. In fact, though, after only a bit of digging, we will see that the digital is tied to one of the oldest problems in human thought and culture, namely the problem of the discrete and the continuous. From the Pythagoreans to Zeno of Elia to Euclid up to Leibniz and Georg Cantor in the modern era and beyond, many have wrestled with the problem of the discrete and the continuous. And I cite Western figures, but the question is, is not limited to the West by any means. Or to put the problem in crass terms, are there two things or is there really just one thing? And anyway, how do you get two things if you start with one? This to me is a fundamental digital question. Now, the easiest way to get two things from one thing is to cut it in half. Although beware, because here we've already kind of cheated or at least smuggled in something new, an operation, an operation adjoined to a substance. So the cutting is an operation. The operation doesn't necessarily have to be defined as cutting. We could also talk about distinction. We could talk about difference or differentiation, as you mentioned. We could call it making discrete, the introduction of the discrete. In any case, this operation, whether as cut, difference, distinction, discretization, results in some kind of rudimentary digital difference. And I'll just stress that this kind of difference really needs to be qualitative in nature, which is to say discrete, um, because there are certainly also ways to think about difference that remain strictly qualitative. Um, but we'll, I'll, side, I'll put that to the side for the moment because modern computers are not built around qualitative difference. Rudimentary digital difference has a more common name in computation. It's called a bit. And I think it's wise to focus on these sorts of binary values, commonly expressed in the form of a one or a zero, famously the ones and the zeros, but equally in other forms as true or false, on, off, high voltage, low voltage, P, Q, or any other pair of terms that can be exactly and uniquely discretized. And as an, as an aside, um, I think the bit is quite literally an embodiment of Aristotle's law of the excluded middle, right? Where you have uh, two positions, but no middle. There's a prohibition on, on, on the middle, on the, on the media, Pro prohibition on the media, prohibition on the third position. And the bit really is a very literal embodiment of Aristotle's law of excluded middle. And I suggest that as a kind of anachronism uh, that I hope might fruitfully reshuffle the historical timeline of digital philosophy. Maybe those are the kinds of things we have to think about. Okay, so cutting, but maybe this cutting is something of a sleight of hand. We might have multiple bits, but not really. Chopping the world up into bits, or atoms, or individuals, into what Euclid defined as arithmetical multiples, in fact, in my view, produces a new kind of continuousness a new monotony of the monad. And hence, I suspect we can rightly describe digital computation as a technology based on one thing rather than two, despite the profusion of digital difference at its core. 
And this, I think, is, is legitimately confusing because there's such a discourse around um, the binary and binarism. In my view, computers are essentially a monist technology. And the digital difference at the heart of computation is not an exception to such consistency, but precisely its very substance. Okay, so again, the skeptic might inter, uh, interject here, uh, yes, but bits are two things, zeros and ones, you just said so, why are you calling this a monism? And that's true maybe in, in a specific sense, but I think it misses the larger point, which is that zero and one are essentially the same type of thing. A thing defined exclusively as having discreetly differentiable values. And actually the fact that we even call them zeros and ones I think is, is deeply uh, misleading. Um, we should just have kind of generic tokens, um, apples and oranges, you know, A and B, something like that. And so again, I think it would be a mistake to think that computers institute a binary regime or a regime of duality. Like the integers, Binary bits are all one kind of thing, even if different bits represent different values. Computers are a species of monism, and that has made all the difference. A constitutional problem thus haunts the invention of digital computers in that they were never endowed with duality. Computers begin from one kind of thing, the bit, and don't really have a reliable way to derive other kinds of things. One might say that computers have a technology for difference, and again, it's qu quantitative difference. They have a technology for difference, but they don't have a technology for the concept. And this presents something of a problem when it comes to traditional philosophy. Why? Well, the standard model of metaphysics, for instance, relies on two things, not one, and two dramatically different kinds of things. As different as mind and body are different, as different as God and humanity are different. And so the hard problem of computation, so-called, has been roughly this. How to construct two kinds of things from only having one at the outset. In other words, if Rene Descartes had a mind-body problem, computers really just have a body-body problem. Computers lost their minds because they never had them in the first place, and there is no ghost in the machine, alas. Engineers have struggled to add the mind somehow, if only in rudiment, by superimposing conceptual differences. And this is why I'm so interested in things like type or data type. Superimposing conceptual differences, we might even say qualitative differences or a reasonable simulation thereof onto sequences of bits. So these include the, the, just the basic conceptual difference between two kinds of bits, bits that are interpreted as data and bits that are interpreted as procedures. And it's very important not to mix those two things up. Right? You can have a se sequence of numbers. You don't know if that's data or whether that's an executable command. Um, you have to be able to figure out how those are different. We could be arranging clusters of bits together according to type. And type, of course, is a metaphysical concept, if there ever was one. Or grouping bits together in spatial and logical arrangements, endowing these arrangements with address indices, and then allowing numbers to refer to other numbers according to these addresses. And in a computer language like C, these references are called pointers. Now this last example is ingenious because it shifts the computer's monism from bug to feature. A number might just represent itself, its own value, right? I am the number seven or something like that. Or it might be serving as a reference to an address. 
its own value, seven, now miraculously interpreted as an arrow pointing to something else entirely. And this is powerful because numbers are, un are maybe not uniquely, but they're especially promiscuous in this sense. In genius, such references are also hazardous. Given the learning curve involved in effectively programming using pointers, not to mention the host of potential bugs that tend to accompany them. Um, certainly a source, if not the greatest source of bugs in the history of computing. Even the most impressive developments in artificial intelligence do not ultimately disrupt this fundamental arrangement. Historians of AI often point to the difference between AI's some, quote, symbolic phase or rationalist phase in the 1950s and 1960s, a confirmed failure, in fact, and today's empirical phase or data-driven phase, judged by many to be a runaway success. So after it became clear that, the symbolic, that symbolic logic alone would not produce convincing results, AI researchers supplemented their digital methods, frankly, with a series of analog ones. Focusing on empirical data, using inductive logic, embracing stochasticism and probability, plus adopting a whole variety of kind of living methods, things like neural networks, evolutionary algorithms, and cellular automata. And much of this was helped along by improvements in graph theory and clustering algorithms. Now, the results are no doubt spectacular. Yet, I suspect that the concatenation of billions or trillions of trivially simple calculations doesn't somehow undo or invert the constitutive characteristics of the digital. I guess some people would argue that they do, but I'd argue that they don't. I suspect, in effect, that digital computers are forever trapped in what Hegel called bad infinity. Billions or trillions make it much larger. It doesn't matter. Sheer numeracy can make up for a lot of weaknesses, and hence is one of the principal strategies of the digital economy. Nevertheless, sheer numeracy will never solve this body-body problem. No mere quantitative extension will ever generate a dialectical inversion, at least not in the Hegelian sense, to say nothing of the Marxist sense. And in fact, Leibniz knew this as well in the 17th century as, uh, as part of his um, critique of Descartes, right? If you simply repeat points or monads, you will never get extension, Leibniz said. You will never get a synthetic whole, at least according to Leibniz. And in any case, the fact that AI engineers have basically given up on uh, deriving value from discrete rationality alone uh, in favor of extracting value from empirical data, I think that confirms these conclusions all the more. That if value comes out of the black box, this value was no doubt originally sourced from the actual, not the digital. Or in the old joke from Lacan, if you pull a rabbit out of a hat, it's because you put the rabbit in there to begin with. But what is this all for? What foundational lack is the digital machine so worried about filling? And here I, resist, I, I insist on steadfastly resisting epistemological questions, uh, which is certainly the more popular option, I think, for digital theory thus far, concerned as it has been with representation and simulation or, quote, what we can know using these machines, or even whether these machines can know anything on their own, turning instead 
to material questions, you might say, ontological questions, the forms of being and presence that are wrought by the digital. Um, and again, this is not to say that those other questions, the epistemological ones, are unimportant, simply that we actually have a lot of examples of them. In order to delineate digitality's foundational lack, some scholars will paint a picture of the world in stark relief. We've heard about the digital side already, so what about the other side, the analog side? Some scholars will call this the actual in order to differentiate it from a more virtual digitality. And I, I'm, I'm skeptical of this language, but I think it's worth kind of spelling it out here. So if the digital is ruled by the logic of necessity, the actual follows the logic of contingency. If the digital is tangled up in that unholy trinity of enlightenment thinking, namely positivism, rationalism, and instrumentalism, the actual accommodates ambiguity, indeterminacy, and inefficiency. And Aidan Evans, who I referred to a minute ago, he furnishes the reader with a series of evocative keywords to help understand this notion of the actual. So this is a quote, difference, becoming, freedom, uncertainty, accident, noise, virtuality, groundlessness, faith. And at one moment, he even connects this, the, this notion of the actual with Lacan's notion of the real, um, which maybe we can't get to tonight, but could be a suggestive prompt for future investigation. And pushing his vocabulary in creative directions, he describes the actual as having a, a kind of, quote, meshiness. And this is a, a word that stems from mesh, or network, but also containing hints of messy or messiness, so it's meshiness. Or in another nice turn of phrase, Evans highlights the rule-bound quality of the digital, dubbed ruliness, in order to differentiate it more effectively from the characteristic unruliness of the actual. And I like that sort of taking unruliness and then proposing ruliness. In Leibniz, the terms were necessary and contingent. Kant's terms were analytic and synthetic. OK, so I'm not entirely on board with, with this description. And I think those of different philosophical persuasions would, would quibble over the details, perhaps. Um, but the core of Evans's metaphysics has been foundational to Western philosophy for a very long time. Nature is rich and full of contingency, while machines are rote and deterministic. And if modern life is plagued by the discontents of alienation and ennui, or worse, we would certainly benefit from scrutinizing the, the ontological imbalance on which it rests. A different outlook might emerge, Evans writes, an outlook that would better value, quote, the social over the individual, the continuous over the discrete, becoming over being, and finally, difference over identity. So in fact, it's a very vivid picture that he's trying to paint here. The social, the continuous, becoming, difference. It's a beautiful path, to be sure, if not also a noble one. But here, I worry. I worry about a new kind of analog chauvinism, a simple reversal and pat replacement for that old digital chauvinism, chronicled by the likes of Theodore Adorno, Donna Haraway, and many others, as regressive, if not also oppressive. In other words, dualism still sucks, even if you side with the subordinated term. 
But monism sucks too, even if Gilles Deleuze showed us a beautiful monism with all of the messy ambiguity of earthly things. And in the past, I've tried to imagine a way of thinking that is neither digital nor analog. And many others have been guided by a similar impulse, that this digital analog distinction is part of the problem, so why don't we just get rid of it? And I'm somewhat seduced by that, but I think today this strikes me as a luxury we cannot afford. The symbolic order is alive and well, whether it be in the command of the sovereign or the infrastructure of the machine. The digital is the site of contemporary power. The digital is where capital exploits labor. The digital organizes technologies, bodies, and societies. And so this is why I still want to insist that we have to turn our attention back to the digital, not to forget about the other side, real analogicity, but to kind of uh, 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 affirm them both um, as, as co-equal. Here we encounter an obstacle, namely Kittler's notorious claim that there is no software. In Kittler's celebrated essay of that name, There Is No Software, the software layer dissolves, but only because its logic is but an epiphenomenon of similar processes happening at the hardware level. And as we have seen from the very beginning, Kittler certainly knew something about software, and he knew something about hardware as well. Um, and here I will simply agree with Paul Fagelfeld. Uh, this is a quote that I love. This is Paul. Kittler is a liar. Kittler is a liar like Odysseus. Of course there is such a thing as software. Kittler himself wrote quite a bit of it. So if for others the computer was a fetish, a mystical shell, enclosing a seemingly unknowable kernel, for Kittler, the computer was a postmodern Tower of Babel. That's his quote, a postmodern Tower of Babel. Only ever understandable at the electrical level, with the higher programming languages obfuscating an inherently more legible so uh, hardware. And he was very strong on this. Quote, modern media technology, ever since the invention of film and gramophones, is fundamentally arranged to undermine sensory perception. Kittler grumbled. We can simply no longer know what our writing is doing, and least of all, when we are programming, end quote. So after praising, in fact, Apple computer uh, for building, quote, both the first and the most elegant operating systems, Kittler slammed Microsoft Windows. He hated Windows. Calling it, quote, the dumbest of all operating systems. Dumb for many reasons, Kittler, who did his word processing in Word Perfect, singled out one reason in particular. Um, and I love this, this is another classic kind of Kittlerism. Um, why, is it, why is it so dumb? Because the disk operating system, AKA DOS, this is Kittler, cannot read file names with more than eight letters. The proper name word perfect at 11 letters long is in fact not writable, <laughs> but must be abbreviated to shorter snippets like WP. So according to Kittler, these kinds of acronyms, WP, quote, revoke the elementary innovation of ancient Greece. Namely, the enrichment of consonants with vowels. Okay. Quote, keenly interested in the reality of things was how Kittler ultimately characterized his own flavor of philosophy. The reality of things. Quote, I have come to think of myself simply as a philosopher who nevertheless 
is keenly interested in the reality of things, as opposed to a philosopher who reflects on reflection, as it were. And this is just how I'll wrap up. So isn't that the heart of the issue here? Here and elsewhere, Kittler expressed an interest in philosophy, yet always a philosophy oriented toward the reality of things. It's not that he was against theory, on the contrary, yet he always seemed to prefer history or aesthetics. Um, and I was reminded that Kittler's professorship at Humboldt, I don't know what his position was here, but at Humboldt was in media aesthetics and history, not media theory or media philosophy, and certainly not media studies with its North American aftertastes. So what does it mean to have this dynamic, to, to prefer the reality of things and to be skeptical of reflection or reflection on reflection? What does it mean to prefer circuits over software? To prefer history over theory? Strings over particles? Synthesizers over analyzers? It's a very vivid dynamic. Shall we not admonish Kittler for his analog chauvinism? And in a certain sense, Kittler's There Is No Software is really one of the great romantic, if not also reactionary, texts in all of media studies. For if there is no software, there is also no mind, no concept, no spirit, no consciousness, no philosophy. Quote, ultimately, there is no software for the same reason that there is no higher faculty known as Geist, mind, or spirit, wrote Jeffrey Winthrop Young in a revealing analysis. For Kittler, software and spirit, quote, are no more than fleeting configurations that can be reduced to the switching on and off of countless tiny circuits routed through hollow containers made of tin, bone, or plastic. Or, as he once said in an interview, there are no such things as thoughts. And that, I would say, is a good way to spot an analog philosopher. And perhaps we would need to look elsewhere, ultimately, in order to answer some of the most pressing questions of our age. So thanks for your attention, and I really look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot.